And we are live with our UFC 300 review. I am John Pollock, joined by Jack Winon, coming off a nearly eight-hour broadcast of fights from Saturday night at the T-Mobile Arena. How are you today, Jack? I'm good. To be honest, you know, there are a lot of these longer pay-per-views that can feel like a slog. And last night wasn't that, honestly. I think that the lineup and the performances that we got on last night's card didn't make it so that I was really counting down the rounds and waiting for the end of the night and just really hoping like, Oh, I can go to bed in this many rounds or whatever. It, it was a, it was a pretty easy watch in my opinion, despite its length, which I think is a pretty rare case for the UFC. I agree with you frequently for these pay-per-views. I find the pacing to be, I don't know what necessarily is the difference, but I, I tend to not feel it as much during a lot of these UFC broadcasts and by the end of the night that I'm looking down it's like I have been watching fights for just about a third of an entire day and it's an incredible amount of time um but this was an excellent show and like you I did not have too many complaints about the length and I mean this card on paper we talked about it on Friday it was among the deepest in UFC history and I think you got I think that this was a card that if you were going in even as a uh, like holding this to this grand standard, I think this card achieved that. Totally, yeah. I, I think that there were a lot of high hopes, high hopes for this card, and going into it, one of the things I was talking about was you can have a great card on paper, but the way it plays out is a total different story. And, you know, this card played out like how it looked on paper, which is pretty great. So we are going to be getting into uh, all of the 13 fights that went down on Saturday night, again, at the T-Mobile Arena, UFC 300, and they announced an attendance of 20,067 and a gate of $16.5 million with $300,000 bonuses, which if, if you want a, a GIF for the antitrust lawsuit, just go watch that podium on Thursday when they announced the bonuses and the reaction from the fighters about $300,000 bonuses. If that doesn't say everything right there, Jack. Guys, Dana White is so generous. He didn't have to, but he uh, pulled some strings and he got some, uh, you know, he, he called a friend, got the money for it. And now everyone's uh, with the performance bonuses getting 300,000. No, I mean, j jokes aside, the, the weird thing about this is like, even though it's obviously great whenever fighters get more money, it's one of those things where like the, there's nothing stopping them from doing these things. So when it happens, you're, you're like, well, why aren't you doing this more, you know? Do you think this will still be a profitable event for the UFC? I say that. Oh, geez. I mean, I don't know. This business you model doesn't doesn't seem sustainable. It's going to be really tight to see if if, if, this, <laughs> if this one crosses that that threshold. But yeah, um, you know, it's one I, thing with I like these sell a few more canvas ads. Yeah. Um. Anyway, it, it was great to see the the fact that the bonuses were higher for this one, and we're going to talk about a fight that uh, two guys absolutely. Uh, deserved uh, 300k and then some uh, but we will get into all of that later um, as well we will talk about some of the news afterward because there was a fair amount of news from Dana White's press conference uh, concerning upcoming pay-per-views we will uh, couch that for later but let's start off with the main event between uh, Alex Pereira and Jamal Hill for the UFC light heavyweight championship this was Jamal Hill's return to action after a pickup game of basketball the the downfall of so many great fighters and coming back from a torn Achilles tendon and this fight was, I mean, largely contained to three minutes and 14 seconds after Alex Pereira. We found out afterwards, coming into this fight with a broken toe, that was not going to uh, stop things from uh, from happening, would be uh, quite the downfall of this main event. It would be the, uh, the, the, the natural curse after UFC 200 lost its main event. But nonetheless, the fight stuck to, uh, stayed together. And, I mean, the, the key moment of this fight was Alex Pereira getting kicked low and Herb Dean coming in to give him time, and Alex Pereira doesn't even acknowledge Herb Dean. He doesn't take his eyes off of his target, waves off Herb Dean, and then proceeds to drop Jamal Hill with a short left hook and drills him with strikes on top and gets the finish at 3 minutes and 14 seconds of the first round. On most cards, uh, Jack, this would be the, uh, the, the memorable ending to a fight, but not on this night. But nonetheless, it was quite a statement victory here for Alex Pereira. And I think that overall, this guy, aside from like the one loss to Israel Adesanya, I mean, this guy has crafted a, an unbelievable uh, just resume for himself in such a short amount of time that this is just his latest uh, victim, his latest win. And I think he is 
starting to kind of penetrate that upper echelon of, of stars in the UFC. It is so bizarre to me that when like writing and looking back at his career, like mentioning previous moments in his career, we're talking about things that happened like one year ago, like him making the move up to light heavyweight and getting the championship all happened so quickly. And it's wild that we're already talking about someone who has defended his, his belt once and is looking forward to his next defense. He, he made the, he threw out the idea of fighting on the Brazil card next month. And it's like, yeah, that's not happening. But in three weeks, three weeks, he was, he was willing to take this fight uh, in, in Brazil. Yeah. So I, this was a, a great performance for him. Like you described it really this moment that this fight was boiled down to one moment. I mean, there wasn't really much to say about it before then. Uh, but I, I think that what's interesting about Pereira is that if he can keep this going, he will be the first light heavyweight since John Jones to really carve out an era in the division. We haven't seen an era since John Jones left. We've just seen a lot of guys get a shot at the title and have their, their moment in the sun, but nobody like Pereira is actually putting together something here. I think that what's worth noting is that even though Jan Blahowitz, the first champion since Jones, defended his title, he defended it in a fight where Adesanya was jumping up 20 pounds to face him in a champion versus champion match. It, it, I think I personally think that's a different story than facing someone who is in your natural division, especially when you take into account how much greater that difference in weight between middleweight and light heavyweight is compared to other divisions. But yeah, I think that this was a, a big win for Pereira. It continues to establish him as a highlight reel striking talent. And I think that if he keeps this going, he's going to be one of the biggest stars in the promotion. How do you feel about the idea of him He's obviously open to the idea of heavyweight. And when you're looking at what are the most attractive fights for Alex Pereira, I mean, he's probably staring at a rematch with, with Prohaska after tonight at light heavyweight. At heavyweight, I mean, I, I mean, they remarked on the broadcast, like it is a miracle this man was competing at middleweight. I mean, he is gigantic for 205 pounds. I don't think he would be that uh, undersized at heavyweight, but does that appeal to you seeing him go up to heavyweight and or do you feel that this is sort of his lane that he could really become a dominant light heavyweight i don't like to entertain the the multi-division ideas until someone's really cleaned out their division and with one defense i just don't think we're there yet with Pereira. am i declining the idea of this happening in the future absolutely not we could definitely see him make the the leap up to heavyweight someday but I, I just don't think we're there yet. I, I think that he needs a couple more fights in this division before we can start talking about real super fight uh, pursuits at a higher weight class. Then we go to Zhang Wei Li and Yan Shaonan. <laughs> this was one of the more bizarre fights I have seen in quite some time. So, I mean, Zhang Wei, uh, Zhang Wei Li was the second largest favorite on this card coming in. She was uh, listed as a minus 520 favorite. And... I thought was going to secure the uh, one of the performance bonuses by her her win at the end of the first round, and I was like, "Wow, we're going to get two uh, buzzer beater finishes in back to back fights here." Because in the first round, um, it is uh, Zhang lighting her up with left hooks, and then does this big hip throw, getting to side control, mounts her back. I mean, Zhang Wei Li was such a superior grappler throughout this fight, but gets this choke applied, and it is deep. And Yan Xiaonan not even really fighting it. She is just withstanding this. And you hear the, the, the clapper go that there's 10 seconds to go. And I'm just like, there is no way this woman is lasting 10 seconds with how deep this is. But the horn sounds and you're like, wow, she, she was stood and barely because as, she, as Zhang Wai Li releases the choke, dude, she is like limp. She is out cold. And the broadcasters are noting this. I mean, your referee, Jason Herzog, I think he's realizing like he could have he could have waved this off. Like just because um, the, the the horn sounds does not mean you can still you could still end the fight based on the fight ending sequence. He could have done that, but opted to let her continue. And amazingly, Yan Chaonan gets to see a second round here. But this was as close as you're going to see to a fight ending Um with Yan Xiaonan not only coming back, but managing to win at least a round on my scorecard later. Yeah, I think that first round is going to be something people discuss for a while. The idea of should, like, it's it's interesting, like, when you run into these situations of should someone stay in the fight or had, should they be taken out, people sometimes will reference what happened after the, oh, she made a comeback later, blah, blah, blah. But you, you can't really 
think about those things when, when talking about it because it's like you imagine in the moment of that first round being like well she might have went to sleep for a second there but what if she makes a comeback like you just can't use that logic in those situations i think that i think she went out enough after this first round that they the referee jason herzog had it within his rights to call it here and part of me was surprised he didn't i mean he tends to be one of the more consistent referees when it comes to calls like this and uh, I mean, Jan, she stumbled to her corner, and it was it was pretty hard to watch. It was kind of like in the moment, you're th- like, are they really sending her out for the second round? And yeah. this is, um, you know, it it is worth deciphering the difference of like a flash knockout versus a versus a choke. But I was more so in your camp that I think Jason Herzog could have stopped this, and yeah. it would have been perfectly acceptable. Um, but she comes out, and then you know the second. I went 10 8 here. There, there are some that might go so far as to like this woman was out. If you wanted to go 10 7, you probably could justify like one of those unicorn 10 7 scores. I went 10 8 on this first round. The second round, I mean, Zhang again just gets her down and flattens her and just is landing so many strikes, looking for the opening for another choke. And Jason Herzog, like he is taking a step in. He is ready to call this, and he's probably already on high alert at the beginning of this round, knowing the state Yan Xiaonan is in. But Yan Xiaonan is able to withstand an arm triangle and gets out, reverses on top right at the end of the round. Um, so she survived these first 10 minutes and i do emphasize the word survived because on my card it was 2016 after two rounds jack did you go so far as two ten eights? So how did you score these first two yeah i had it as two ten eights, and i'm not against the idea of making one of them 10 7 i mean when you use the criteria you can make that argument but i always when when looking at scores like this i do take into account that the actual judges tend to be much more conservative with yes. the 10 8s and the 10 the the, the non 10 9 rounds so as much as it is important to score the rounds like that when when you see it like that in the criteria it's worth considering like it's not always like that in reality with the judges i think that with with uh the second round here yawn the damage she consumed i would have to say was probably cuz she was still shaken after the first round and I was honestly surprised that it didn't get stopped here because uh, even though uh, Zhang struggled more with the submission attempts, Yan was really getting pounded away with these ground and pound shots. And there were a few moments where there was such a consecutive amount of blows that I think there was a, a justified you know, part to stop the fight here. I, I think that the only part in the fight where Yan found an opening was when Zhang started to tire and slow down. Yeah, I think that that was just the accumulation of those 10 minutes for, for Zhang, because in the third round, it's it's definitely Yan Xiaonan's best round of the entire fight. And that said, she is still taken down and, get, and gets her back mounted at the beginning here. Uh, but then Zhang gets the back, flattens... Oh, sorry, I'm going back here to the second round. In the third, <laughs> I was, I'm all over the place. It was a late night, folks. Uh, the <laughs> third round, we come in, and uh, Yan knocks Zhang off balance after a sidekick, and then drops her, and is attacking with kicks while Zhang is on her back and uh yan gets her down she's in half guard after both had landed simultaneously and it's yan with a leg sweep at the end so not like a dominant round but certainly the round that i scored for yan shaunan which was i mean pretty damn impressive given the fact of the the first two rounds of what she withstood at this point um to at least show life here in this third round yeah, and I, th- I think it only made sense for uh, Zhang to do what she did next for the next few rounds, which was to just get the fight back on the ground and try to overwhelm Yan. And I, I think that was the-, the smart plan here. I mean, the third round was scary. And for a few minutes, the commentators were talking about, like, could we be seeing an upset here? The the live odds, like, went down to, like, 100 on both sides. But once we got out of that third round, we kind of realized that that was just sort of like a, a mid-fight shock because once we got to seeing this fight as a, a full story, we saw that was kind of a, a blip in it, a blip in it, and it ended up being a dominating performance for Zhang. If anything, it was an off round for Zhang Wei Li, and yeah. she prepared for the championship rounds. And again, as Jack kind of outlined here, I mean, it was just Zhang getting the superior position, flattening her in the fourth, uh, landing hammer fists, and then in the fifth gets the back again, mounts her. I mean, it just the grappling. There was a great deficiency between these two, and Zhang Wei Li gets the unanimous decision victory. Amazingly, this goes the full 25, uh, 49, 45. And as Jack and I are toiling with the idea of a 10-7 round in the 
first. I believe all three judges scored that one 10-9. So that does tell you <laughs> the, the conservative nature of some of the scoring here as a woman was literally put out at the end of this first round. So Zhang Wei Li retains. We also skipped over one of my favorite parts of any UFC broadcast. That's the the conspiracy theory. And that was Daniel Cormier, who thought he had seen the trainer uh, whisper to uh, Yan Xiaonan, I can wake her up. And Daniel Cormier thought he saw smelling salts. And then they were informed during the broadcast. No, he was uh, he was using water to try and uh, uh, revive her. So there were no smelling salts here uh, per Detective Daniel Cormier. We almost got uh, Greg Hardy and Haler Gate 2.0 in oh, the corner. Could you have imagined? Here. Yes. And uh, I didn't actually see what was going on in the corner, so I I heard the the smelling salt thing. I was like, oh, what's this about? Uh, you know, I'll look into it if it becomes a bigger issue. But then later in the fight, when Jan had a good opportunity, I was thinking, oh no, this could be like a no contest if if something happened in the corner. But. Uh, Joe Ended Rogan is not doing the follow up. Are you sure? Should we get confirmation? He's just going right. Is that legal? Can we use smelling salt? I mean, <laughs> these two were just going down their path of like what happened here. John Anik, much more reserved of let's check with the truck and see what they I, saw here. I think that there's pros and cons to having having a guy in the booth like Joe Rogan, which will just say whatever he thinks and whether it's good or bad for the fight. You know, sometimes you'll get moments where he'll disagree with a call and it'll be great to have that sort of dissenting opinion in the booth. But there'll be sometimes where he's just saying something and it's just kind of like just wrong. <laughs> well, Zhang Weili, I, I thought she, you know, uh, looked excellent as much as you could in in this fight. I would say this one largely overperformed because this was not one of the fights that I think were, was jumping off the page at people in terms of the UFC 300 lineup. Uh, they were talking afterwards at the press conference of just how big of a fight this was in China. Um, but overall, I, you know, they were also in the most impossible position of following the fight we're about to discuss as well. But I mean, this turned into a really entertaining fight because of just the bizarre nature of that first round and just how dominant Zhang was for the first two rounds. I think that the fight was kind of in a cool down spot to use like a wrestling term. And unfortunately, like, even though there were some really exciting moments, you could tell the crowd just wasn't fully into it, despite how back and forth and how interesting it was at times, just because they were coming off of what was a, a knockout of the year contender and an incredible matchup. Then we move on to the BMF championship fight between Max Holloway and the defending BMF champion, Justin Gaethje at 155 pounds and... This was coming in with uh, grand expectations. They were uh, remarkably met and then some. So we are starting things off. Um, Michael Buffer also, know, or sorry, Bruce Buffer, noting that it, this is the undisputed BMF championship because could you imagine a world where we have an interim BMF champion? Could that, that, could that be? That would a, be a disaster. I mean, who is actually the baddest? Is one the, the second baddest and then yeah. the, the... Among the baddest MFs, yeah. yes. Uh, so early on, it's... Um, Max Holloway is coming out and he is looking very sharp early on, but he's eating several calf kicks and this would be a consistent offensive weapon by Justin G uh, Gaethje. And the first one does like send Max Holloway off balance and you're seeing just the, the power that Gaethje has in these calf kicks, but Holloway responds and his left hook was very effective in this opening round, stunning Gaethje. But then the key one was a spin kick that was aimed for the body, but Gaethje is almost like shooting in. So he takes this right on the nose and he goes to his corner and he's telling Trevor Whit Whitman that his nose is completely blocked and when they showed the replay like this could not have been more flush with the heel going right into the nose it was one of the most effective strikes of the entire fight and kind of set the pace here for uh round two and Justin Gaethje who would have to be dealing with many facial issues uh throughout these next rounds it became a tough night for Gaethje from that point forward. I think that was one of the moments that made it clear that even though both these guys are high-level strikers, it was going to be Holloway leading the dance. The the second round, okay, this got very ugly here because there's an eye poke to Gaethje and time is called and the replay of this. I mean, Max Holloway's finger is like disappearing inside of the eye socket of Justin Gaethje. This was a really bad eye poke. And then moments later, Max Holloway pokes the other eye. All right, so we, we're, we're getting a tribute here to Chris Weidman here in the second round, and this resulted in a stern warning for Max Holloway. Uh, stern warning is one step before the ultimate warning, which is one step before this is your final warning, and then maybe we'll take a point away. But, I mean, these were two pretty egregious eye pokes, not to say they were um, uh, deliberate, but... 
my God, this guy who's already potentially dealing with a shattered nose, and now he's been <laughs> poked in both eyes. I mean, this was a really rough round for Gaethje, and and Holloway still managed to like win the round um, with the better striking. And but had a point been deducted, I it's one of those arguments. And this comes 24 hours after they have announced the introduction of these new gloves that are going to be introduced. I believe at UFC 302 that maybe will curb some of these, but um, yeah, this was a uh, not the not the prettiest of rounds, Jack. Maybe there's some sort of rule that if if you are a BMF or you want to be a BMF, you have to fight in a in a, in a match that where where more eye pokes or more fouls are allowed. Because if you're a BMF, you don't complain about those things. It's bloodline but, rules, okay? In yeah, the BMF <laughs> bloodline fight. rules in this match. Uh, yeah, I I was uh, surprised there wasn't any sort of. Well, I'm, I guess I'm not surprised, but there, there probably should have been something on that second foul because realistically, as much as you can try to stop eye pokes with gloves or technology or something like that, a big part of stopping it can just be scaring fighters into accidentally doing it less. I mean, that's one of the, the ways to do it and giving them all these warnings and being lax about it and being, oh, okay, okay, just don't do it again. Hard warning. That's well, not how you solve it. The third continues and it's Holloway again, like just utilizing his right hand. He's ducking and countering just his timing was really on point. He's having a ton of success with the right hand. Gaethje is trying to manage with, with leg kicks, but um, I, I had Holloway up three rounds going into the fourth, but the fourth round uh, Holloway is responding after Gaethje comes out very aggressively, uh, but Gaethje, you can see like he is covering up and I think it was just the nose that was giving him a ton of trouble after that first round, but Gaethje, throws a big shot, Holloway comes back with his right hand, and it's continued calf kicks, but then in the final minute or so, it's Gaethje just landing some big jabs, and he drops Holloway momentarily. Holloway maintains it was a slip, and it did not actually get recorded as a knockdown. I kind of felt it was a knockdown, but uh, you can you can debate. Um, Gaethje's best round of the fight, I did give this round to Gaethje, but then everything leads to the fifth and final round. Holloway is out with uh, push kicks, another spin kick to the body that was um, he used frequently in this fight and is using more down down the stretch. And there's a moment where Holloway just unloads on Gaethje with putting him up against the fence, body shots, knees. It was just a huge series from Holloway. But then we're counting things down. We think this is just signed, sealed, and delivered decision for Max Holloway. And the final seconds are upon us when Max Holloway just stands in the center and says, let's go. And these two just throw everything. And then in the closing second, literally the closing second, Max Holloway drops Justin Gaethje with this right hand and Gaethje face plants on top of the canvas. And the finish comes at 459 of the fifth round. Max Holloway wins by knockout. Jack, I, I think one of the most spectacular finishes I've ever seen to an MMA fight. It's so incredible that we look at someone like Max Holloway, who has had such an accomplished career and such a highlight real career. And heading into this weekend, you sort of think like, what more moments can he possibly provide for this promotion? And then he goes out there and gives us probably one of the best of his entire career. And, I, you know, it's just one of those moments where when you see it, you're like, did I really just see that? I think what makes it so surprising to me is the fact that Holloway, the person who is up easily three, you know, four rounds at this point, he was the person calling for this crazy brawl in the middle of the cage. It wasn't Gaethje who, you know, needed some sort of Hail Mary to win the fight. It was Holloway who clearly just wanted to create a moment despite being up and being literally one second away from a comfortable decision win. This was quite the moment it was quite the fight i think that even if they didn't have this this wild exchange at the end it still would have been a fight that people said was um entertaining but i mean this moment adds so much to it yeah when, when it comes to uh finishing someone with a second to go um you know you had it was not a great fight but the ending was incredible with demetrius johnson and kyoji horaguchi in montreal then a few years ago it was yair rodriguez and the korean zombie um i mean this just dwarfed those when it comes to just the finish at the end uh not like a come from behind win i mean max holloway was comfortably ahead but man i've been like racking my brain thinking like the greatest finish to an mma fight i just think given the fact that this was such a massive show that so many people saw like going into the, I would call like the greatest performance I'd seen from Max Holloway prior was the Calvin Cater fight on ABC. I just thought like 
on that night, I don't think there was a better fighter in the world than Max Holloway on that night. But in this one, this is going to probably be uh, what, like, this will be the closing image when that Hall of Fame video airs for Max Holloway. It's going to be this shot that will be synonymous with his career of face planting Justin Gaethje. And I mean, you talk about a guy that comes in and a loss, what it would have meant to him, it, it, like just totally separate paths now where, man, he's got a avenue at lightweight. He's got an avenue at featherweight. His star power has never been higher. And this was an all timer of an ending. And there's, there's part of me that just wants to see him explore lightweight uh, now that he's put on this weight rather than doing this dance back and forth between featherweight and lightweight. But I mean, I said on Friday, like, I don't know if Ilya Taporia is the best stylistic fight for him, but man, I'm interested to see that fight. Um, but there's also a lot of fights at lightweight for him. I mean, he can kind of write his ticket after this. It's going to be a big fight that he gets uh, next, but this, I mean, if you have not seen this, this is a must see as are all the reaction videos to this that I've watched many of uh, this morning. I think what's interesting or, or worth remembering is that a lot of people counted Holloway out heading into this fight. You know, his previous trip up to lightweight didn't go his way and Gaethje is still a, a tough out in the division. So I think a lot of people were thinking this might be a disastrous fight for him going up a weight class and facing another tough striker, but it ended up being a pretty great performance for him. He wanted a featherweight title fight afterwards, and even if you do think it's not the best matchup for him, and you know, I, I think there's certainly something to that that might not be the best matchup for him. For someone like Holloway, this right now might be the last chance in his career to get a shot at featherweight. So I think they should probably do that. I think even if there is things for him to explore at lightweight, featherweight is his home division. That's you know where he has been, you know, fighting as a champion in the past. And he is more than qualified for a shot right now, in my opinion. I think he was qualified before this weekend. And I don't know if a win at lightweight actually does too much to that case, but it certainly helps that he's still on a winning streak coming out of this weekend. He's not coming off a loss. I think he is easily one of the top contenders for the title at the moment. It's also like coming out of a performance like this um, and Ilya Taporia, like if you have followed like his rapid ascension especially in spain like this guy has become a celebrity there since since winning this title like that that's a major fight Ilya taporia and max holloway um that I, I can certainly see that being the direction and we'll get into it later but islam makachev is now set for ufc 302 to defend the lightweight title against dustin poirier as well so he is at least occupied for that period but Lightweight's going to be an avenue too for uh, Max Holloway. So an excellent, excellent fight. And this would be uh, not only the fight of the night, but also Max Holloway grabbing a performance of the night bonus. So coming out with 600K here. Yeah. And I guess my question there is like, does that, does that, I was a little confused by that. Cause it's like, if you're getting a fight of the night performance bonus, that, that is a bonus you're getting for your performance. So should you get another performance bonus on top of that? Like, I know this was like a great, a great, outing from him and like a, a career highlight for him but i mean a lot of people on this card were fighting for those 300 grand and he he uh took up two of them there it's it's not unprecedented that they have done the uh the fight of the night slash performance uh dual bonus for for one fighter um but yeah to, to your point like there were a lot of people on this card that i hope were getting some uh discretionary uh bonuses because they're they're as much as the audience lost their minds for this end i could see a lot of the fighters on the undercard watching this and realizing there goes my 300k as they watch the ending of this fight yeah <laughs> charles Oliveira and arman sarukian at 155 pounds is the next fight we'll talk about um Oliveira had a great first round here where he immediately got this arm in guillotine and you're thinking man this is going to be it he mounts him but sarukian is defending uh Oliveira then gets an elbow from the mount but sarukian reverses gets on top into his guard and then Oliveira lands an illegal up kick as time is called no point deduction um i don't even think he got the stern warning yet so he still had another up kick left in his arsenal if he needed it uh but they get back to their feet after the restart so Oliveira wins the first round and then things turn around for uh Sarukian, including this axe kick that he delivers pretty much to the crown of the head and when they showed the replay like dude this guy did like some ddp yoga stuff with his leg it went straight up like dude 
12 o'clock, his leg was up and just comes down and crashes on top of Oliveira's head. He gets the takedown. He's working inside of Oliveira's guard and is throwing elbows, cuts up Oliveira, and Oliveira just tries for a triangle in the final seconds unsuccessfully. So likely tied on some people's cards. Did you did you go with Oliveira in the first round? Because this was kind of a... It was a very close round. It was more so the how much credence you gave to the submission attempt at the beginning. Yeah, I went with Oliveira, but this is one of those fights where when talking about the scoring of it, it really is an interesting discussion. Like we, we talk about robberies and we talk about like, you know, things like that. But this is one of those fights where I, I really do find it interesting just to hear the different perspectives of how people scored it, because this was a tough round, tough one to score. I think that the second round in this fight was the only one that was like really easy to to score and the first and the third were were pretty hard calls to make. Well, Sarukian is using his jab. He's shooting for a takedown, gets it. But then Oliveira tries for a guillotine after being taken down. But Sarukian is in side control. His neck is out of danger. And he takes the back of Oliveira, kneeing him in the body. And then he slips off the back. And Oliveira works for a darse. And it's looking secure. Uh, Sarukian is like belly down on the mat. But he's giving the thumbs up that he's okay. And he does pop up as soon as the horn sounds. Um... But I, I get like a lot were focused on this Dars joke. Like, how deep was it, and how much how much value do you give that submission? Because Oliveira bookended this fight with two very impressive looking submissions. Uh, but it's Armand Sarukian winning by split decision. Uh, one judge had it 29-28 for Oliveira. The other two 29-28 the other way. Um, that is the score I had with uh, Sarukian. But you know there was certainly an argument to be made about the. The, the first and third rounds that this was a close fight. Yeah. And I don't think that's any slight on either of these fighters. This is a really competitive matchup to make really high on the lightweight rankings. I think this was a good look for Sarukian to, to be a former champion and to beat someone who was just months ago in the title picture. I, I, I think that now that we know he's not going to get a title shot next, I think he has a fair case to say that after Mankashev's next fight, that he can be in line, next in line for a, a shot at the belt. So Armand Skrukian, big win for him against uh, Charles Oliveira. And then opening up the pay-per-view card was uh, Bo Nickel against Cody Brundage. Bo Nickel, the largest favorite on this card at minus 1450. Cody Brundage coming out to Mariah Carey's fantasy. It's a good choice. Yeah, this this would predate your life by how many years? This was a '95 release. <laughs> I'm gonna save you the the making you feel old moment. We already did that on the preview show. I feel like it, it takes years off people's lives to remind them of these things. Well, Bo Nickel uh, early on places him against the fence. He's clinching, gets his hooks in, and works for a rear naked choke. But then Nickel gets to the mount. He's landing elbows, and Brundage uh, isolates his hand, preventing the choke. Uh, gets out of the first round. So this is the first time that Bo Nickel is going to see a second round. Uh, and then in the second, Nickel gets the double leg. The crowd is is booing this, but then Nickel gets to the mount and eventually to the back, secures the rear naked choke for the submission. And I'm like writing down my notes, like a good win for Bo Nickel. Bo Nickel gets up, thumbs down. He's booing himself. He tells Dana, nah, not, not a good performance. Uh, he was not happy with this, but he submits him at 338 of the second round, improves to 6-0, and and... He said he thought he would dominate. He gave Brundage too many opportunities. You've never seen a winner so disappointed. <laughs> it's wild. I mean, I know a lot of fighters that are, you know, their their biggest critic, and I think that's fair to an extent. This was like a not a pr proportionate response to the type of performance he had. He got a second round finish. He dominated basically the entire fight. Dude, just because you didn't finish it earlier doesn't mean you should be disappointed. I was also, I mean, I, the, the booing I was surprised by. I know that Nickel has this reputation for having a lot of quick wins, but you cannot grow as a fighter if you are just having these really fast performances. You need to have these fights in deeper waters. And this isn't even deeper waters. This is the second round. He got a finish, and he was kind of cruising before then. Like, I, I think that these are the type of fights that are going to slowly build Bo up, and I, I saw no problem here, despite the boos and despite him being so uh, down about a pretty solid outing. Yeah, I, I think like that level of, of self-criticism, it, it can be very, it, it, it's a sign of a guy that, that's very fueled, obviously. I think that is what separates some some fighters from being very good fighters to 
great fighters, I would definitely caution. Like if I was in his corner, be like, listen, you can have all those feelings. Let's not vocalize them uh, to, to everybody, uh, especially to uh, Dana White. But it's it's your per- prerogative to handle a win or a loss, however you choose. But I think and Dana White pretty much stated after the fact, like, listen, this guy has a ton of pressure on himself. It's like, don't uh, don't don't allow all this pressure on you there. There's a lot on this guy like he was like, here is this guy that. I think everyone sees having the opportunity to have championship level um, aspirations, and he faced a lot of criticism just for being on the main card of such a loaded event. And the other side of that is, man, look at the the amount of expectation that Bo Nickel has six fights into his pro career, and he's and half of those have been in the UFC. Most fighters in his position would not be in the UFC, or if they were in the UFC, they would be on the the prelims of an Apex card where it is diehards and gamblers watching. I don't think that (laughs) takes anything away from his skill level, but I think it shows that where he is in his career, he is facing so much more pressure than most people. Sure, he comes from his his wrestling background. Sure, he is incredibly talented. But you cannot, you know, downgrade how much pressure is being put on this guy, especially like you said, when he's on this card and there was a whole discourse around why is he above all these other fights? He doesn't deserve this spot on the on the card. It it was I I thought that whole discourse was kind of lame because it's like not a big deal. This is how you showcase people. It's not the end of the world. It ended up being an okay fight. Yeah, I mean, it it did feel as though like this UFC 300 card, there was. It went in stages of fan expectation. Then it was accelerated by like Dana White just fanning the flames of like, man, this is going to blow your minds. And I think that that brought itself like once it was like fight after fight after fight. It's like, okay, this is going to be a pretty damn great card. And then it almost felt like, well, there needs to be some holes that are poked at. And Bo Nickel received some of that. The main event received some of that. But I think largely the fan base by this week i think looked at this as like i think they they've done about as strong of a job given the options that they had available to load this card up that this was pretty satisfactory if your biggest complaint is you know fight placement you know what i mean i I was just about to say that the the amount of discourse we saw around a fight's placement on the card just shows that there was this is such a strong lineup i mean most of the time some of these ufc cards it's just like low hanging fruit to make fun of how how bad quality some of it is but this one i mean really you had to you had to look hard to find somewhere to to drag it i mean for for all those people that want to look and and throw holes into to this card like let's take a look at some of these upcoming apex cards okay because <laughs> i mean dude like the the cabinet is pretty bare for some of these fight nights uh coming out of uh, this weekend show uh, but let's go into the uh, the early prelims and we'll uh, zip through some of these. Uh, Yuri Prohaska and Alexander Rockage. Rockage has not competed since May of 2022, tore his ACL, but he is back here. And man, he was looking great until he wasn't. Um, first round, man, he was, uh, they were mentioning he is up to like 230 after rehydrating after the fact. So, I mean, this man just jumping up in weight. Uh, Rakic is delivering leg kicks to, to both legs of Prohaska and then is landing with a right hand and Prohaska's left leg looked like a mess almost immediately. He's being tagged and then Prohaska stuns him with a right hand and tries for a flying knee right at the end of the round into the second and it's Prohaska with a head kick and both just start abandoning uh, all game plans and just throwing wildly. And now this becomes Prohaska's wheelhouse because he stuns him after a clean right. He's chasing down Rakic, lands these big shots, and then Rakic goes to the mat as Prohaska gets on top and is drilling him with strikes until Herb Dean steps in at 317 of the second round. I thought Alexander Rakic, especially in that first round, was looking like, man, this is this might be um, the best version of Alexander Rakic, but Prohaska had a big comeback in the second. And, you know, d- probably sets himself up to be a a contender for Alex Pereira. You could do that rematch. Um, A good win here for Prohaska. Definitely a good win. Were you up to speed on this samurai discourse around uh, Prohaska? So I did not know this was such a debated topic so (laughs) that it took up the lion's share of the post-fight speech was Joe Rogan mentioning the fact that, um, like, 
you're not technically a samurai, you know, you're not licensed to be, you know, you don't have your plaque that says samurai. And Prohaska gives this like a lot of oxy. He's like, I know I'm not an actual samurai, but I subscribe to their, men I'm paraphrasing here. I mean, yeah, this guy gave us a, like a pretty philosophical look into his head about how he identifies as a samurai, even though he cannot be fully um, described as a samurai. So wasn't the it wasn't it a grudge match because Rockic said he's not a samurai and I think that's where it began. Yes, Yuri got Yuri got mad and he was like, "Well, yeah, I'm not a samurai, but I I'm I'm mad about this because I follow the the teachings of samurai." So, and then he I, took I, I out a sword was, and he beheaded Rockic right there in the octagon and said, "I think Who's this a might samurai have been now? a I think this might have been a first for uh, a storyline heading into a UFC fight." Yes, this was. Yuri Prohaska is a different breed, and uh, we definitely got that in the uh, the post-fight interview. But then we go to uh, Calvin Cater against Aljamain Sterling. Sterling coming up to 145 pounds. Um, dude, he was bigger than Calvin Cater here. I mean, he looked huge for featherweight. I mean, this guy, this guy, this might be a detour for lightweight for Aljamain Sterling when all is said and done. I mean, holy Christ. It's wild. I mean... You just have these moments sometimes where you see someone go up to a weight class and you think, how did this person even live under that stricter weight class before? It's it's one of those moments where, like, how did he get to a championship level at bantamweight and how did he not decide to move up earlier? So I, I would say of all the fights that this might have been the weakest fight on the entire card, it was Sterling looking Sterling in uh, the course of 15 minutes here. Um, and just a flat outing from Calvin Cater. I mean, Sterling would work for the single leg early on, um, getting him back, getting him down to the ground and just he, like he got four takedowns alone in the first round into the second. It's Sterling just getting him down against the cage crowd was very restless here. Just but this wrestling game plan was working for Sterling because he was getting no pushback from Calvin Cater, who is just shut down um, striking wise. He gets into side control near the end. And then, man, if this is not the zinger that Calvin Cater, the line he is going to have to live with at the end of the second, John Anik notes that Eljamain Sterling has more takedowns than Cater has landed significant strikes after 10 minutes. Uh, that one's going to bruise in the third. It's Sterling closing the distance with a, with a body lock presses Cater against the fence. And then the most spectacular moment of the, uh, the entire fight, Sterling lifts him and, while they, while Daniel Cormier called this a power bomb, dude, this is every bit like a uh, Tiger Driver '91 by uh, El Jermaine Sterling. Is he lifts and just drops this guy on his neck and then lands shots and uh, goes for a darts near the end and uh, like this was one way traffic for the entire fight. Calvin Cater landed eight significant strikes for the entire fight of 29 throwing. Not to say Sterling had a huge output himself, 39 of 71, but also securing uh, eight of 13 takedowns in this fight. So Sterling gets an easy 30-27 victory. Um, but as much as Sterling got the win here, this was a fight that like, I just have not recalled Calvin Cater having such a flat performance as we saw here over 15 minutes. It was a stellar outing from sterling uh he was able to hit that tiger driver uh i'm not looking forward to the unsafe worker discourse we're gonna have uh following that spot but uh, it wasn't I even think the finish wasn't even the finish yeah i mean just the the way people put matches together nowadays i, I it's crazy uh but yeah this was a, a great performance from him I, dc was really like going in on him for not like doing more in this matchup but this was a guy who was coming back after losing a, a fight against sean o'malley and he was moving up weight class I can't really blame him for playing it safe and just having a completely dominant performance. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. At the end of the day, this is a sport and you need to win to succeed. You need to win to get paid. Some of these people, most of them, are on a show pay basis. You get double the pay if you win. So having a safe performance like this, I can't blame Sterling. And I, I don't think it's any slight on him. I think he was just... He, was he, he wasn't getting any resistance. Like eight takedowns. Like, yeah, he's just going to continue this. Like... um you know, and Calvin Cater, too. I mean, I hadn't realized it, it was October of 2022, the last yeah. time he fought. So he has had an extended uh, break as well. Um, you wonder if that played into things, but he is 36 now and he's been in a lot of big action fights in his uh, featherweight career. But I, I agreed with you. Like, yeah, this was not a super entertaining fight. But for Aljamain Sterling, like this was um, walking through the door at featherweight, getting a win, and he's going to have a top opponent at featherweight, um, which is a very deep weight class it, it it doesn't help that he was just in stellar 
company on this night. I mean, this was not the card to have a okay performance on because everyone else was just going to blow it out of the water. But, I mean, you can't take that away from Sterling. This is this was a good fight, and coming from that championship background in bantamweight and now with a win at featherweight, he has uh, some interesting options now. Next was the highly anticipated UFC debut of Kayla Harrison taking on fifth-ranked Holly Holm at 135 pounds. Um, that was the focus of the weigh-ins, and Kayla Harrison did make weight at 136 pounds. Um, this being a woman who, in the Olympics, competed at 171 pounds in judo um, and you know had stated and has been reflected upon the fact that she uh, could not continue during the doing the featherweight season or sorry the lightweight seasons at pfl knowing that i can't make this weight so many times a year and kind of intimated this week that the ufc like they were not going to keep this featherweight division open like her entryway into ufc meant getting down to 135 but she she managed to do it here and she came out with as strong of of, of a performance as you could ask for against a very well regarded opponent in holly home to the point I, I thought the the line was long here. I thought Holly Holm was a very active underdog, but that did not prove to be a uh uh in actuality when it came to Holmes' performance here. But Holm enters and clinches with her and even managed to uh get a reversal on Harrison before she is thrown to the ground and Harrison gets on top in half guard, landing some big strikes, mixing in elbows, very dominant round for Kayla Harrison in, in the first. And then the second, it's a head kick by Harrison, goes for the guillotine by the cage and gets a trip takedown, mounts home, and then sinks in the choke and gets the submission at 147 of the second round. She was very respectful, putting over Holly Holm as a legend in the sport, but she is proclaiming she will be champion by the end of the year. And then we got a video from Amanda Nunez after as well, uh, listening to this uh, post-fight speech from Kayla Harrison and indicating uh, a potential return for Amanda Nunez. So... Um, it was like she passed this debut with flying colors and I think could be uh, thrown into a title fight next if you wanted to go that direction. That's how strong she looked here. On a weekend where so many people doubted her and so many people thought of ways in which this couldn't go her way, it really couldn't have gone better from start to finish. Making weight with no issues seemingly, having this great performance against Holly Holm, a very respected name in the division, and now positioning herself really well at bantamweight. I think that there was, for a good reason, a lot of questions about Harrison heading into this weekend. How would she make a weight class that she has never been in before? How would she perform against someone like Holly Holm, who was really experienced, especially in that weight class? She proved that she deserves to be in this division and that she is now a strong part of the weight class. And I think that for everyone who was wondering, like, you know, what is she doing with this? Like, how is this going to possibly work for her? Clearly, she had some sort of plan. and She had the confidence that this would work out because... Well, it did. You've got uh, Raquel Pallington, Juliana Pena, Ketlin Vieta, Mira Bueno Silva, and Arena Eldana in the top four, uh, along with Pennington as, as champion. Uh, was it was this like this is a division that greatly needs that added star power? Someone like a Kayla Harrison. Are you bothering with one more fight for Kayla Harrison, or is she fighting for a title in her next fight? I don't know. I. I'm I'm okay with it either way. I think that I wouldn't be bothered if they gave her a title fight because, look, it's this fresh face. It's someone with a lot of hype. It's someone who now has a, a win in the divi the division. And would probably I, be I, the favorite in that fight, like, odds-wise. I think I think Kayla Harrison would be a comfortable favorite against if it's a Raquel Pennington. Um, it's hard to object to it. You know, the, the division has doesn't have a lot of really fresh matchups. And Harrison being there, especially coming off this win, I feel like you have to use that to its full potential. I, I think a, a title fight here would work. So it was a great performance by Kayla Harrison. Uh, the big question is going to be how often can she fight at this weight class? Like, I don't think this is someone that we're going to be seeing fighting three times a year at bantamweight. I think she's going to have to be very strategic with how often she fights and it would not, you know, she, she obviously has it in her mindset of fighting one more time this year. And I, I would suppose that would be kind of, latter part of 2024 which would work out very well to fight for a championship the televised prelims opened with Sadiq Yusuf who tried to angle for bonuses for the early prelims the te televised prelims and the pay-per-view and um was shut down almost as 
directly as Joaquin Buckley was at the press conference, but he was taking on the surging Diego Lopez at 145 pounds. And this one did not last very long because uh, Lopez is coming in with calf kicks, an uppercut puts Yusuf down, but gets back to their feet. And then another right uppercut drops Yusuf. He is flattened and finished with ground and pound. And this lasted all of a minute 29 as Lopez improves to 24 and six with his third victory in the UFC following wins against Gavin Tucker and Pat Sabatini. If it wasn't for the Max Holloway, Justin Gaethje fight, taking the fight of the night bonus and another performance bonus, I think Lopez easily would have exited this event with one here. Yeah, it was, you know, as good of a performance as you, you could ask for in the limited time that they had. Lopez was, you know, he was featured on Embedded. I think they they see him as a rising star at 145 pounds, not ranked coming in, but likely will be after the uh, the latest set comes out. And then we go to the early prelims, Jalen Turner against Hanato Moicano. This was, I mean, on its own would have been a, a very uh, bizarre fight. L- let me ask you this, Jack, uh, as as we look ahead to uh, next weekend's uh, main event between uh, Mataus Nikolaou and Alex Perez, was there one fight on this card that was not a bigger fight than next week's main event? Or t- sorry, two <laughs> weeks from, from tonight, last night. Well, next week's card was supposed to be bigger before because it was going to have Manel Cop in it. And, you know, he's a, a really talented flyweight. But I, I would say no. The answer is no. There's There was no fight on this card that was that is greater than the next week's main event. Well, uh, Jalen Turner thought he was going to have a, a a quick night because he's uh, after eating a body. Or, sorry, Moicano is the one that eats the body kick early, clinches Turner, and then Turner gets to half guard. A lot of pressure from Moicano on top, and then Turner uses defense to get back to his feet and drops Moicano with a straight left, and he's going for the walk off KO. Put my stamp on that three hundred thousand dollar check. Um, but it's not over. Moicano rises from the dead and he sees a second round and Moicano gets the takedown off the fence, mounts him. He's working with strike, working with strikes and then settles for half guard. And amazingly, the, this crowd was like booing. This was like the fourth fight of the night. Uh, hardly a, a dull affair. And he gets back to mount and it's just heavy ground and pound. Herb Dean stops the fight at 411 of the second round. So after Moicano, they teased like the knockout finish. Um, Jalen Turner is going to be kicking himself over that because I I think one follow up and it's done. I think Herb Dean would have stopped it with one follow up strike because man, Moicano just dropped from that left hand. But it's Moicano, money Moicano, getting the victory and another memorable post fight speech. This is one of those fights where I really think it's tragic. Like I feel bad for Turner, and you know when people do get walk off. KOs were never like you idiot why aren't you going to the ground or whatever but it is one of the situations where you know he he should have followed him to the ground but I I, I I can only feel bad for Turner in this situation he had a a win right there in front of him and it was snatched away from Moicano the underdog who was able to crawl back and earn a big victory what did you think about what are your thoughts about private property that Moicano got into in his post-fight speech listen I think that if they didn't have uh, TV limits to hit and things to do, he could have been there for another hour. Here's a sample of what we heard. I love the first amendment. I can I want to carry an old fucking gas. I love it. Property, property. And let me tell you something. If you care about your fucking country, I'll read Ludwig von Mises and the six lessons of the Austrian economic school, motherfuckers. <laughs> I mean, this man's just in his own world in these post-fight speeches, but there you go, folks. Did you even know that he was doing a fight before then, or was he just sort of... I guess one thing that I'm wondering is, like, are these thoughts going through his head during the fight, and he's wondering, like, okay, I'm going to talk about this, I'm going to talk about that, and all these other things that have nothing to do with MMA? Like, or, or does it just come to him right after he's done fighting and he can start thinking about other things? I think he's just free, I think he's just freestyling after the, after these fights with the, just a total stream of consciousness. Joe Rogan just, it, like, three times just wanted to ask about the fight. Moicano had no interest in talking about this fight. So, there you go. He, he gets the win and uh, improves to 19. 19- I, I want to mention, uh, I, I think thought the highlight of the the post fight interview was him telling Joe Rogan I have a new podcast and you're going to go on it you don't have a choice yeah he was um did not get the confirmation from Joe Rogan but yeah he wasn't he, asking for it no he was just you're my first guest on Monday so we, that's we'll how see. I uh, got put on the show actually you just messaged me and said uh, Jack you're doing the UFC 300 post show I'm not asking that's 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 how I do it yes <laughs> 
Jessica Andrade and uh, Marina Rodriguez at 115 pounds. Um, they went the distance here. Uh, Andrade was uh, just chopping away at the leg into the first. And then Rodriguez tried for a darts from her back, but doesn't really um, threaten too heavily with it. And Andrade just continued in side control for the remainder. In the second, uh, Rodriguez has some success with the right hand at the beginning. And then she's getting a lot of strikes off. Andrade reacts and then lands with an elbow and lands multiple power shots with Rodriguez against the fence. So Rodriguez is like on her way to winning this round, but it was a strong finish for Andrade. And then the third, it's a spinning back fist that lands for Rodriguez and Andrade just basically swats her and puts Rodriguez onto her back, lands a big right hand as they get up. And then Rodriguez tries for the guillotine with her back against the cage, uh, but Andrade just pushes her off which is the second time I've seen a, a guillotine attempt this week and then someone being pushed off this uh, this past week with, this, oh, with footage. And then Andrade hits a leg kick and uh, it gives out on Rodriguez. So Andrade gets the split decision victory, 29-28 in her favor by two of the judges and one scoring it the same for Rodriguez. I thought I thought this was a pretty clear Andrade win. I don't really understand the split decision, but hey, I mean, the right person won, so I guess that's not a huge deal. Yeah, I gave the third to Rodriguez, but yeah, that that was it. And then Bobby Green and Jim Miller. You have uh, Jim Miller, who has the most fights in UFC history with 44 after this and the most wins at 26. He would not be adding to that number. And of course, the veteran of UFC 100, UFC 200, UFC 300. And I'm as much as he seemed open to the idea of it, I, I don't think we will be seeing him at UFC 400. Maybe he can come back for like an exhibition grappling match or something. Yeah, I think that that would be fine. He he should have lifetime season tickets to every UFC event. Um, but my goodness, this first round, uh, Miller rocks him with this right and Green backs up from it. Then Miller tags him again. And then it's kind of Bobby Green just getting very defensive, but he's landing a lot of counters. But then at the end, it's Miller who rocks him with this shot and follows with more strikes. So it was kind of... Miller had this great se sequence at the beginning and the end of the round while it was Bobby Green in between. And I think it's how you value how effective the striking was for Jim Miller. I did go with Jim Miller in this first round. How did you score the first? Yeah, I think Miller had a good start, but uh, I think how the fight panned out from there on was really what made it des deciding in, in the way of Green. If this was a one round exhibition, it would have been a great feel good moment for Jim Miller fans, but. Then we had rounds two and three to go. And this is when Bobby Green just starts getting his combinations off. He cuts Miller open uh, under the eye, busts him open in the nose, and Duke Green is just jabbing away, increasing his volume, very little response from Jim Miller, and tons of head movement from Bobby Green as he has found his rhythm. Very big round for Green. Miller in between thinks he has broken his finger. That would be the least of his problems. And then in the third, it's Green with this major combination that lands. He is so much quicker than Jim Miller. He is landing with ease increasing the punch combinations and then um green just clinches after he does eat one strike both are throwing in the final minute miller goes down and uh, green gets a takedown at the end i thought the third was so dominant i, I went with a 10-8 for bobby green so i had it uh 29 27 for bobby green the scores read were 30 27 30 25 and 29 26 meaning two judges had a pair of 10-8 rounds in this uh, fight for Bobby Green. So outside of that first round, I mean, it was uh, it was the Bobby Green show, the Bobby Green show, and Jim Miller looked like he had survived the horror film by the end of this. His face was destroyed, multiple cuts. Um, yeah, it, it, it was a tough watch if you were a Jim Miller supporter. Yeah, and as great as it would have been for him to get a win on 300 after his 200 and 100 wins, I think just him being here is a testament to the success of his career and th they gave him a tough matchup for where he is in his career. And I'm not really let down that he, he lost here. I, I think that just being on this show was such a statement. It was. And I think you've seen like Jim Miller has, you know, he has been matched against adequate competitive talent that he is the level that he is at. This was a step above that with a Bobby green. I think it does kind of tell you the, you know, if Jim Miller is going to continue his career, which I imagine he will be like, there is, you know, th there's a, a matchmaking style for a Jim Miller at this stage of his career. I, I think he's very much in a gatekeeper role. And I don't say that as an insult. I think there are people in divisions who play important roles for, rising talent and he has been sort of that guy to test newer fighters or fighters who aren't in the rankings but might be on the way up and i i think that 
this was certainly a, a different matchup for him. And then afterward, Bobby Green called out Patty Pimblett, you slimy, sugary little snake. And he wants to fight him in Manchester in July. So there you have it. Setting I like his, that. Uh, his, his next fight. And then we opened with two former champions, Devison Figueredo and Cody Garbrandt at 135 pounds. Uh, Garbrandt was having a, a good opening round here. He's throwing kicks, very clean strikes when uh, Figueredo would uh, come back with a knee down the middle. And then Figueredo tries to go to the back. Get, Garbrandt won't exchange. And Garbrandt lands with a left on a combination throw in. They scramble at the end. Not a decisive round for either guy. I did lean Garbrandt in the first. Uh, did not matter, though, because in the second, we, we got the end as... Figueredo gets his uh, hands free and starts throwing, tries for an arm triangle, but Garbrandt is surviving, and Figueredo goes to the mount, and then as Figueredo maintains the mount, Garbrandt tries to roll while Figueredo is able to secure the back and locks in the rear naked choke and gets the sub at four minutes, two seconds of round number two. Yeah, good performance from Figueredo. He's still very early into his bantamweight run here, but I think it's a division that will... Uh, suit him and I, I think this was a great performance for him uh, I think two fights into his bantamweight run now yes yes he uh, was coming off the Rob Font win so is now 2-0 and at bantamweight conversely Cody Garbrandt what does this tell you about sort of where he is at in his career the guy is only 32 but it feels like we have seen so much of Cody Garbrandt at, at, at this point do you feel this is sort of um you know, where, where, where he goes at a division that is so contingent on speed and, and where, where he's at. Do you feel he's just going to be one of like a 500 fighter that is still going to have a name value attached to him, but outside of sort of ever getting back to championship level aspirations? I don't see him as a championship level fighter, but I don't see this loss as one where it's like, okay, it's time to hang it up or whatever. He has taken much worse losses before. I, I, this is not one that signals to me some sort of major concern. He looked good to start the fight against Figueredo, who was a champion quite recently. I, I Do I think that another championship run is in Garbrandt's future? No, but can he stick around the bantamweight division and face legitimate guys? I think so. And that was UFC 300. I thought a excellent, excellent card with an all-time memorable fight in Max Holloway and Justin Gaethje with uh, the, the ending that it had. I, I just thought this was an excellent show overall, and we, we skipped over it. They also had a great um, set of moments involving Mark Coleman on the show where he was brought out with his daughters and then got to uh, hand the BMF title to Max Holloway after their fight. And throughout the broadcast, like they leaned heavily on you know old moments, uh, fighters in the crowd from yesteryear like this was the most i can recall a ufc broadcast leaning into its history promoting that as a big fact it's something they could certainly do a lot more of but i was glad to see like this felt like a different type of presentation than just we're gonna slap on 300 and this is a bunch of great fights without any kind of reflection on the past earlier in the day i was wondering like I know they're not going to do face the pain for the pay-per-view intro, but what if they do it for earlier in the card? Oh, and then boy. they did it for the the second half of the prelims, and it was oh my god, it was so great. I was oh, I god. was ready to run through a wall after watching that. Face pain is so good. It's so timeless. I watched it on UFC 40 last week. Decades later, it is still such a good intro, even though it is the same formula for every single event, the, the same way they do it every single time. They, if they kept if they brought it back nobody would be like oh take this this is an old concept get rid of it it's it's so great i think they did a great job honoring the past one of the things that ufc has been criticized for before is that they kind of just ignore their past they just talk about the present only and you and i both being wrestling people we know how much wrestling can can lean on the past and really try to make that a, a big part of the current product and UFC did a really good job of incorporating that on this show. And I think what's great is they did a lot of it on the prelims, but then once they got to the main card, it was very okay. It's business time. Let's let's talk about the big fights here. They also announced the um, fight announcement for the UFC Hall of Fame with the UFC 117 fight, the first fight between Anderson Silva and Chael Sonnen, which uh, featured another incredible fight ending sequence where Anderson Silva was down uh, and in the final minutes of the fight catches Chael Sonnen with a triangle and retains his middleweight championship like an all-time legendary fight and a pretty legendary build-up to that fight that kind of cemented Chael Sonnen as 
one of the stars of the company, even in, in defeat against Anderson Silva. And then they would do uh, the rematch in 2012. Um, but yes, that will be added to the UFC Hall of Fame that they announced for Thursday, June 27th, which is the lead into UFC 303. Yeah, I mean, that's if you're going to have a fight wing for your Hall of Fame, that was inevitably going to get in there sometime. And then Dana White made the announcement afterward that UFC 302 that is happening in at the Prudential Center in Newark, New Jersey on June the 1st, it's going to be headlined by Islam Makachev and Dustin Poirier for the lightweight championship, as well as a five round contest before between former middleweight champion Sean Strickland and Paulo Costa. And then like this is a note that is handed to Dana White and he reads the note and then adds uh, June 29th UFC 303. Conor McGregor versus Michael Chandler, five rounds. It was like that. That's our announcement of uh, of the return of Conor McGregor and Michael Chandler. This like eighteen month long wait for this announcement, and it comes. I, I was kind of surprised they didn't like just make a big deal out of this on on the broadcast itself from from the promoter himself, who stated in this press conference, "I'm in the business of creating holy shit moments." And uh, and here he reads from a note: uh, Conor McGregor, Michael Chandler. But that's your fight, June 29th, and. All of a sudden, like these cards that were very much uh, lacking big announcements, now you have attached some significant fights to them, and 303 is going to be a very big card for them. A few days ago, I was talking about how much this card sacrificed the future cards of USC, and my verdict was that however 301 looks, or whatever the main event for, sorry, for 302 is really going to determine how much the, the quality of future pay-per-views has been hurt. I think that 302, 303, they have a decent lineup of pay-per-views there. Uh, I, I wasn't expecting to get two massive main events announced at like 2 a.m. last night, and I certainly wasn't happy about it as I had already filed my newsletter and was ready to go to sleep. But uh, th these are two really big matchups, and I think for Chandler, I have to feel relieved that you're actually on paper getting this match scheduled after a year of pleading for it, after not fighting and not getting those fight checks, after going on Monday Night Raw to cut a promo on Conor McGregor. He's finally getting this fight. Well, what did you make of the fact that we were talking about this on some of our shows this week, that this was going to be an interesting set of weekends to see the, the like the TKO synergy of WWE and UFC with both of their biggest shows on back to back weekends. And it wasn't really the case of cross promotion on either side. It felt like WWE was in their lane and promoted WrestleMania. UFC was in its lane. If anything, the cross promotion, uh, occurred at Power Slap on Friday where a bunch of the WWE people were sent to the Power Slap event of all places. Um, but but it seemed as though like there, this was not viewed as, you know, doing that kind of crossover that I'm curious to see like how much of it we are going to see in the future. Yeah, and you know, when we saw Chandler on Raw, that was like a really interesting blatant crossover. I feel like a lot of the crossover that we've seen so far has very much been on the business side. Yes. You know, selling events to the same clients that will pay site fees, bundling events in venues where, hey, you can get UFC and then WWE right after or something like that. You're not seeing too much of it on screen. I'm, I am certainly interested to see what we're going to get in the future when it comes to that. And it, it does seem like they're still testing the waters. I think that Chandler being on Raw was a huge testing the waters moment for that type of crossover. So we'll end off here. Um, we had the, uh, of course, we've got the Fight Night card coming up in two weeks, April 27th at the Apex, the world-renowned Apex with uh, Matush Nikolao and Alex Perez in your flyweight main event. And then the next pay-per-view is in three weeks in Brazil, which... Uh, I don't think he's going to feature Alex Pereira, but crazier things have happened. Alexandra Pantoja against Steve Ursig for the flyweight championship and Jose Aldo coming out of MMA retirement. The man has been active in boxing since his uh, UFC retirement to take on Jonathan Martinez. Uh, Anthony Smith is in action on this card. I mean, hardly a super deep card. This does feel like kind of the come down after UFC 300. I do not see this being a, a giant uh, pay-per-view for the company by any stretch. It's absolutely a come down. I think that that flyweight fight is a really great fight, and some people are going to sleep on it, especially because Urseg is only a few fights into his run in the UFC, and he hasn't necessarily had huge spotlights. But he's a really interesting fighter, and he has a real underdog story to overcome in this matchup that could be really fun to watch. Jose Aldo is going to be the people's main event 
easily for this card. A lot of people, a huge chunk of people, I would imagine, are going to be tuning in to see him after his very unconvincing retirement. And it'll be interesting to see how he does. All right. That was UFC 300. Um, is this your leading candidate for uh, card of the year? I know we're only uh, three months and change into the year. Would this be the front runner for show of the year? Oh, it has to be. I mean, you, you think about a lot of cards and a lot of them are, are going to be very main event based. This is a very rare situation for UFC where they're taking a pay-per-view and saying we're going to stack the entire thing start to finish 6 p.m. to 2 a.m. I don't think we're going to get anything like this for the rest of the year. And a huge part of that is because it's hard to make these shows. You need the infrastructure in the UFC of having debuting fighters or losing streak fighters on your lineups. You can't just always build cards like this where it's tons of rising fighters with a ton of uh, current momentum. You, you can't always do this. So it's hard to get It's hard to get these cards. I don't think we'll get one like this next this year. Might not even get one next year. So definitely a card of the year contender as it stands. All right. Well, that's going to wrap things up for us. I want to thank everyone for tuning in to our post show. Jack has a full report on UFC 300 up at postwrestling.com that you can go check out. And uh, we will be back covering UFC 301 in just a couple of weeks. So thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And that wraps it up for us. Goodbye.